Welcome to another week of life. Let us join our voices now in our call to worship. Arise today in the newness of our Lord. Allow the fresh breezes of resurrection to fill any wound or any gap with healing grace. Let us speak our joy, shout our faith, pray our thanksgiving, and sing our praise. Let us in the great gift of our shared faith enter to celebrate the mysteries and freedom found in this day of resurrection.
In the wake of COVID-19, the Asian American community has been grappling with the increased repetitive trauma of anti-Asian racism and violence. Asian siblings, you, me, us, we know, we understand. This past year has been painful beyond words. Most recently, we were devastated, but not surprised by the mass shooting in Atlanta that targeted Asians and specifically Asian women. We will not be silent. People have reached out and asked, are you okay? No, we are not okay. The blow that has knocked over our Asian elderly women, men, and children for simply being Asian has knocked us over too. It has taken away our breath as well as any sense of safety or normalcy. Raise your voice. Since the emergence of COVID-19, we've seen an alarming rise in anti-Asian violence. Over the last 12 months, this AAPI hate has swelled to 3,800 recorded incidents. Asian businesses have been vandalized, and Asian women, elders, and children have been targets of violence. We are living in a reckoning moment. We belong. The history of U.S. anti-Asian racism is long and awful. The first Chinese immigrants were brought as laborers in the 1850s and later were deemed evil and dangerous and called yellow peril. We remember the Chinese massacre of 1871, the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, the Japanese American mass incarceration during World War II, the murder of Vincent Chin, and the list goes on. This is the historical backdrop of our country's treatment of Asians. Stand with us. Racial violence is rooted in the treatment of Asians as perpetual foreigners. Every comment of speak English or go back home tells us you do not belong. But we do belong because this is our country. And so we will rise up and speak against the racism against our Asian American sisters and brothers, as well as for our black, brown and indigenous brothers and sisters, because this is our country. So we stand with you in solidarity. Stand with us and speak up. Refuse to be silent any longer. We will not be silent. For Asian Pacific Islander women, racism and misogyny work together to erase us. But this is not the story that God has written for us. We are not invisible. We are sisters, daughters, aunties, leaders, pastors. We are Tan Xiao Jie, Fung Dao Yo, Hyun Jung Kim Grant, Kim Soon Chong, Pak Soon Jong, Yu Yong E. We are the embodied Imago Day. We are loved by God who sees us and hears. You belong. We belong. Asian American sisters, we are gutted and heartbroken with you. We honor and name the Imago Day in you. We continue to lament the dehumanization and sexualization that you have experienced as Asian women. We acknowledge the pain and anger you feel at dignity denied, lives lost, and the repeated lack of justice and respect for the women in our community. Raise your voice. We lament with our Asian American community and rebuke the pervasive systemic evil that has senselessly taken Asian lives. For the victims and the families of the Atlanta shootings, we grieve with you and we will fight alongside you. We will not be silent. We stand with you, stand with us. We acknowledge that at times in history, we have not spoken up and have absorbed the pain and trauma. But trauma builds upon trauma, and we are not healing from it. We acknowledge that we have often been silent because we have been culturally and socially conditioned to remain silent, even though we have a story and a voice. 
we will not be silent. But this must be a new day. We are committed to speaking and leading our communities, organizations, churches, and areas of influence to be a voice for and with the unheard in our Asian community. Raise your voice. In this pivotal moment, we will not back down. We will stand strong against the powers and principalities that seek to cause destruction and division among Asian, Black, Brown, and Indigenous peoples. We belong. We name that racial inequality continues to exist in our society today for all communities of color. And in order to stand against this injustice, we must stand together. And we urge all our sisters and brothers, black, brown, indigenous, and especially our white sisters and brothers to stand with us. We take seriously our call as leaders to bear witness to God's reconciliation and to stand in solidarity with all who are vulnerable, marginalized, and oppressed, as our biblical faith calls us to do. We will not be silent. The multi-ethnic kingdom reality of God described to us in the Holy Scriptures in Revelation 7-9 says that we will be worshiping shoulder to shoulder with our brothers and sisters from every nation, tribe, and tongue. This includes you. If God asks us, we you brothers and sisters on earth, as you are here in heaven, our answer must be yes. Raise your voice. This is how the gospel compels us to live. Your family is my family and my family is your family. Ruth 1.16 says, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. We belong. Healing begins with seeing ourselves as a we bound to one another in Christ's love, a, a constellation of relationships committed to love, to justice, and to one another's flourishing, refusing to alienate or other one another when things demand change and sacrifice. Are we not a body? Are we not God's family? Do we not belong to one another? This is an invitation to be a we, this is a call to stand together. Stand with us. As we live into the embodied solidarity, we will stand in the gap, practice what we preach, and be the body of Christ by living the solidarity we want to see. We will not be silent. Let us support our friends and family of Asian descent. Let us educate ourselves, practicing intentional listening, lament, and repentance around the sin of racism. Let us learn, unlearn, and relearn. We will not be silent. Our silence deepens the grief of those who suffer because it leaves them feeling like they're suffering alone. For their sake, we won't be silent. For their sake, we invite you to not be silent. Raise your voice. Injustice has fractured our nation, our communities, and our churches. Indifference is killing us. Though we are crushed and grieved, ignoring this is not an option. Ignorance is not an option. Stand with us. Lord, you are the God who saves me. Day and night, I cry out to you. May my prayer come before you. Turn your ear to my cry. I am overwhelmed with troubles and my life draws near to death. I am counted among those who go down to the pit. I am like one without strength. Psalm 88, 1 through 4. Most gracious God, forgive us for what we have done 
in bringing evil to your world and allowing it to persist. Our cold words, our self-serving deeds, emerging from our callous hearts and seared consciences. Forgive us for allowing the sins of racism and misogyny to comfortably exist in the church. Forgive us for our lack of compassion and reluctance to render aid, especially when it was in our power to make a difference. Render your justice. May your kingdom come. In Jesus' name, amen. Happy Easter. My name is Nathaniel and I would like to read for you the Easter story from the Gospel of John chapter 20, 1 to 18. I am reading from the New International Version. The Empty Tomb. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Jesus appears to Mary Magdalene. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been. One at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned around. She turned, to she turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me. For I have not yet ascended to, my, to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascended to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with news. I have seen the Lord. And she told them that, and she told them that he had said these things to her. This is the word of the Lord for you and for me. Well, Easter is a day when everyone, all people and the preachers and creation itself is blessed 
with new life. God looks upon us and says, yes, yes, you are mine, and I, and I love you. You know, um, God has many names in, in Scripture, and one of which is, is Elroy. And Elroy is not the cartoon character, but Elroy actually means God who sees us. We never get very far from God. God is always, always with us. And so yesterday, we took time to bless our pets, and many of you were, many of you were with us. We took time to bless our pets and animals that live life with us. You know, especially during this time, this very, very weird time of the pandemic, our pets have become that much more important to us. They are literally getting us through this time of social distancing and, and isolation. Elroy, God who sees us, not only sees us, but our pets, and as we said, all creation, and we are blessed by them. And so as we thank God for them, let's watch this video, a video in celebration and thankfulness for our furry, furry friends. Let's watch. Bless you at your home. Beautiful. And Francine. Francine. We bless you too. We bless you too. Bye, Doc.
the words Elroy, the God who sees us. The biblical thrust is always is always forward. Forward first. It's about the future. The greatest mistake that we make with, with the Bible is believing that it is some book that is concealed and buried in the past, wedged, wedged immovable in ancient ways and encumbered by dust of the centuries. It's, it's not what it is. The biblical way is, is forward forward first it's always it's always future scholars tell me that when moses asks god to self identify to give us a name bibles like to translate it i am who i am but the hebrew verb is not present tense it really is i will be who i will be i am future God seems to be articulating. The greatest apostle, Paul, says, forget about what is behind. Forget about all that stuff. Strain forward to what's ahead. It's future. And Jesus says, keep a hand on that plow. Don't, don't look back. The angel witness that Nathaniel read for us says, you missed him. You missed him. He is quite a bit ahead of you. You'll find him in Galilee. What seems to have come to an end seems to be beginning all over again. He's back at it in Galilee. The show's on. Get moving. Forward. Forward to the future. There have been many, many tombs this year. Too many. Too many to count, too many to comprehend, too many deaths that, that could not have, have proper tombs. And it is easy for us to get stuck right there in the tomb, in death, with, with Mary. Jin Young Choi tells us that the word tomb, the word tomb appears most in John's crucifixion account. The word for die appears more in John than all the Gospels combined. When Mary arrives, the stone is rolled out of the way, no longer obstructing entrance, but it is still early. It's still early, still dark, dawn not yet come. Mary announces only that the body is gone. And Choi states that John's resurrection is not triumphant but it only leads deeper, deeper and further down into the bowels of death and darkness. But it is right there, right there in which she and we unexpectedly encounter the risen Jesus. And so Friday, Friday I pulled up behind a bulk up Jeep wide wide tires that that lifted it lifted it high even above my own truck but on the back window is is a sign that reads feed me one prius per day first to the economic environmentally sound car i had not seen this bumper sticker before and so i i chuckled to myself but then another slogan in the lower left corner of that back window. And in big letters, it says, no one, no one in big letters. And then with smaller letters that read, and, and I have to pull up closer because of my weak eyes. But, but what it said was, again, no one, and then in smaller letters, no one cares about your stick family and shows a truck plowing through a stick family, some of them tumbling over the hood and the top of, of the cab. And I wanna say no, no. 
that is not what life is is all about. It is about it's about solidarity. And it is about loving. It's about loving neighbors. I understand that that sometimes sometimes we we can get caught and sometimes we can tire of seeing and and rehearsing the sorrows of of the day. And there has been so much sorrow. Atlanta, Boulder, LA, DC, Taiwan. And we are caught up in the tense drama that is unfolding in in Minneapolis. And we take time in worship, in worship to to enter the lives of our Asian American Pacific Islander brothers and sisters to lament and to see and to hear them and to stand to stand with them. There's nothing new here. It's just now that it's all being caught on, it's all being caught on tape. We think of the ugliness of the New York attack on a 65-year-old Asian woman. Nothing new. Nothing new, they tell us. It's always been this way. We bring out, we say the names, we sit in its ugly darkness in solidarity with them. And we do so not to get stuck there. Not to get not to get stuck, but to encounter the risen one who is pointing us forward, creating paths forward to a future of a future of God's dreaming and God's kingdom. This was Jesus's passion. This is God's passion. Elroy, the God who sees us, even when it is still dark, the gospel sentinel sounds, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not, the darkness cannot, the darkness will not overcome it. You see, the biblical thrust is always forward. It's forward first. It's, it's all about the future. All the messages and the messengers of the tomb tell us that Christ is way out ahead of us, not stuck in some back memory. It's forward. Always forward. As one said, it's time that we get serious about God's confidence in the future in the future. Peter Marty is the, is the editor of the Christian Century. He's a Lutheran pastor. And he speaks from experience, from his own family, who was once dead in the darkness of their past. And so in a recent article, in a recent article, Marty tells of a maternal grandmother that he that he never met. She collapsed over a bowl of soup at her kitchen table in Louisville, Kentucky in September of 1936, dead on the spot at age 40. Her husband, a Lutheran pastor, struggled mightily to try to get beyond his profound, profound grief. His behavior lying a huge imprint an indelible kind of imprint on the childhood of Marty's mother, who was then just, just eight years old. And so every Sunday afternoon for years, his mother's father would make her, her words, make her go visit the grave. And so the pastor widower would would put on would put on his long black overcoat and fedora, take his little girl by the hand to go to Cave Hill Cemetery to pay respects 
the weekly ritual cast this huge darkness, this pall over the young girl's childhood. And one can only imagine the, the Easter preaching of this wounded Lutheran preacher during those sorrow, sorrowful years. And so Marty writes, Marty writes this. He says that something in me wishes that a grave digger would have walked up to him one Sunday at the cemetery, interrupting his morning ritual and say right to his face, you know, you really need to go and do something else with your Sundays. Good years are, are still ahead of you and your daughter. Go and make something of your life that's not going to happen here. I'll take care. I'll take care of, of the grave. Now, isn't that what the gospel writers are absolutely aching to try to get across to you and to me? Resurrection might not have been the first thing on the early grave visitors' minds, but isn't this the testimony of the angels and the gardeners of the tomb? Hey, I know that you've come here to see, to see Jesus of, of Nazareth, but he ain't here. He's not here. You missed him. In fact, he's way out in front. You need to do something with that grief. Because there's more life out there in front of you. Go, go and tell somebody Jesus has been raised. He might even be in Galilee by now. That's where, that's where you'll find him. Go on. Forward. It's forward first. God's about the future. Go on ahead. I got the grave. You grab the future. What an incredible, incredible message. And it's not an old message of an ancient past. It's contemporary. It's now. It's a good word for today and, and even tomorrow. God says, I got the grave. I got the grave. I've got all of your tombs. You go now. You go now and you grab hold of a new future. It's a good word. Good word for today and tomorrow. Happy Easter. Amen.